Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Unscripted and Unchained RPG Review. I am DM Bloodworth and as you can see by the graphics, today making our return to the Seven Realms of Carador, which is a uh, campaign that I'm running for the Dungeons & Dragons Beck Me game system. This is the, uh, the 1983 box sets, uh, so I'm not really using the uh, the D and D cyclopedia. I'm using the original box sets uh, for this particular campaign, with one notable exception, and that is for the thief character. Um, we're using the uh, Frank Metzner's uh, Jack of All Trades kind of character class for thief, uh, which is more of an adventuring type of thief than a steely kind of thief. So, uh, so using that, so. Um, our first session, a uh, game session, was yesterday. Uh, that was on uh, April 17th. And our uh, zero session, which I had recorded previously, uh, was with uh, five players. And, and now we have the full complement of seven players. So uh, very excited about bringing all seven players together uh, for the first time. And uh, and we really had a, gr a great time, or certainly I had a great time. Um, and I'm hoping that... <laughs> They all come in and, 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 you know, agree basically that they had a good time too. But based on the role playing and, and just the, you know, the amount of uh, fun that we actually had, you know, I'm pretty sure that uh, it was universal. We had a, we had a good time. So um, <coughs> if you are joining uh, for the first time to take a look at this, the Seven Realms of Cador is my is my own campaign setting, and it's a sandbox. So basically, we as a group of players are uh, are creating the world as we as we go through their characters' adventures, and so um, I will plant little seeds here and there, uh, and then the players basically either run with it or they don't. So it's uh, you know, and and that became reflective in how this very first adventure, you know, kind of ran. And I'll, I'll go into some detail with that as well. But uh, let's just go over the characters really quickly. And a lot of the personality of these characters started to come out just from the players. So it wasn't something that they had really written ahead of time or, you know, um, you know, it just developed as it came together. And I was really excited about that as well. So... I'm not necessarily going to go in the order over here that you see. Um, I'm going to go in the order that I have it uh, here. So one of the first characters that kind of stood out was uh, was Noggin the Dwarf. And Noggin is played by Rowan. And one of the things that Rowan kind of developed um, into his character was that Noggin is a really poor dwarf. Um, quite, quite honestly, very destitute, you know, so it's, it's kind of not a surprise that he would find himself in this refugee camp along with, uh, you know, with, with other refugees and, uh, maybe not necessarily the, the other player characters, but, uh, his motivation is to not be impoverished. And so, um, not necessarily greedy, but he just created the sense that he's desperate to have some money just so that he can claim, I guess, that he isn't, uh, he isn't impoverished or he's, he's, you know, finally a little bit, his head is above water. And, and so it was a really interesting, uh, role play that Rowan had done with him. And, um, uh, he's very belligerent and, you know, he knows what he wants and, and he, you know, at points he was saying, you know, I don't care what, what everything else does. As long as we get what I need done, done, then we can go and do those other things. Uh, so really, really great role playing uh, for that character, especially at introduction to everybody else. Uh, it, it was fantastic. Uh, Caspin is played, uh, is our halfling, is played by William. And Caspin comes into this story. And uh, he's in this refugee camp as well, and uh, he's just looking for adventure. And this refugee camp is the place where people from all over are coming in 
to this one area. And so the the belief that you know he has is that there's there's going to be opportunities uh, of hearing stories about strange things happening or hearing the stories of desperation where there needs to be something done about it. And so that's that's where he came in. And so he's seeking adventure. And that's why he's here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Hazen is the magic user. I, and she's played by Josh. And she comes in with an invitation from the local Academy of Magic. And she's given a task to um, that she reveals to everyone else um, that she has to find these, uh, you know, harpy feathers and bring harpy feathers uh, to the to the school of magic. And that there was a rumor that there is a, a harpy roost somewhere in the you know outskirts of the city of Conde. And so that is that's what her motivation is is to bring in these uh these components uh possibly as a like an initiation in order to gain access to the academy of magic because her motivation is to learn as much magic as she possibly can so uh so that's what she brought to this uh this community uh in this campsite and that's what she brings to the group as well as they you know as a dedicated magic user she's you know obviously seeking to learn as much as she can and then utilize it in in helping out the rest of the group uh the next in line is uh Tarande the elf so Tarande is played by uh is played by Dave and Tarande's character became like really interesting in the very first uh, part of the adventure that they were on. It was actually during a mini quest on a small farm, and I'll go into detail when we when we bring that together. But uh, her devotion to her deity, which is a deity of of nature and fertility and and such, really played a role in how the uh how the party was going to resolve the combat situation that they had just completed and it really ties in you know very well um with the party actually respecting what she's looking to do or or asking or even demanding what to do uh as far as uh as far as taking care of the harpy, so there was a tie-in to the other adventures, uh, you know, for the the magic user as well. So, um, and I'll get into more detail when we get to that point. Brother Calder is the cleric, and uh, he's kind of the focal point. Like several other players had his name on a slip of paper as somebody that they wanted to touch bases with. He was sent by the uh, by the the Church of Mitra, uh, so he's a priest of Mitra, uh, to actually go to this uh, site and to help out the refugees as best he can. Um, and so he's cooking for them. He's doing um, he's doing first aid uh, when the when some of the players actually first meet him. <coughs> that's basically what he's doing, because first level clerics in D, D basic don't have any spells yet they don't gain spells until second level so um he had a you know he came off a, a personality wise he's a very you know straightforward bedside manner so very blunt you know at one point he's he's meeting with the the dwarf and the elf and he turns to the patient that he's dealing with and he basically says uh well, the chances are you're probably not going to survive, but I'll see what I can do. And that's the kind of bluntness that he brings as a character. And again, the very first session, all of these little quirky character traits are 
coming out and it didn't have to be written on a sheet of paper. You know, it wasn't rolled on some chart. It's just, you know, true right from the player's, you know, perception of their character uh, just coming out. Um, and, and so you can get that role playing from a very basic game system like Beck Me. Um, next person was uh, War Turtle. War Turtle is the uh, is the fighter, and uh, he's played by uh, by Knight. I, I just call him Knight uh, for short. So um, he's played by Knight, and he's a he was sent here by the garrison of Conde to assist brother brother Calder. <clears throat> and basically to do whatever Brother Calder really needs him to do as far as, you know, backing him up. Uh, and, and, and it's kind of implied if he needs backing up, you know, in, uh, in combat or whatever. That's where, you know, he's uh, meant to be. So we didn't get too much of a, an open window into... War Turtle's uh, motivations. Uh, he's just he's just there to do his job, and his job is is combat, and so uh, and perhaps that is his you know his personality. So uh, you know so that remains to be seen. But right now he's just he's the fighter in the group, and he's the you know the person that uh, you know in his you know plate mail armor and and just you know, ready to just stand out there as being this imposing figure, um, you know, and, and so far fearless in combat from what we've seen. So we'll see how that character continues to develop over time. Uh, finally, we have, uh, we have uh, Lyra, who is the thief. So Lyra is an interesting character. Uh, is played by Jace. And uh, the way that she's playing Lyra is that uh, one of the game mechanics that that she was saddled with, I'll say, is that she doesn't speak the same common tongue as everybody else in the group. But she does speak halfling and she does speak the common language that Caspin uh, also speaks. So she has to translate things through the halfling. And um, and then he translates it to the rest of the party, and that's already started to make a uh, to make a play, you know, in the group's role play, and say, like, all right, well, we'll we'll stop and we'll explain this to her, or we'll ask the halfling to explain this to her, um, and so that's a a connection. Now, hopefully, by the time she gets to second level, uh, she'll have an opportunity to have picked up the common language of this region. But it was it was one of the things that I wanted to include uh, is that not everybody speaks a common tongue across the entire world. It, it just, it's more like a, a very strong dialect difference from one region to the next. So it's like speaking Italian and f comparing it to French or Spanish. You might know a word here or there, but you won't really be able to put up the whole system together or understand uh, complex um, directions or instructions or anything like that. Um, just knowing a very small part of the root language. And, and so that's something that I wanted to include in this. And it, and it seems to have already started to show itself in a role play way. Uh, amongst the party members. So, as I kind of alluded to earlier, each character got a different note. And that note kind of told them, uh, this is why you're here, or this is what you're looking for while you're here. Uh, and in some cases, they got a job offer, you know, a, a quest to do, like the dwarf and the elf had the quest to go to this farm and rid this farm of these giant bats that have been harming their livestock. And so they were pretty much dead set on, all right, we're going to go out there and we're going to take care of this. 
Brother Calder and War Turtle had brought into the fold the um, the thief and the magic user to run this quest uh, to investigate a crypt where these strange sounds were coming from this crypt. It was really spooking all of the their nearby neighbors of the cemetery. And so they had this quest that they wanted to go on to. And as the whole group came together, the, you know, the dwarf was very, you know, as I said, belligerent. He was like, no, I, I got to get paid and this is going to give me pay. They promised me, you know, 10 gold pieces for each large bat or huge bat or whatever it is that I kill and uh, 25 gold pieces for the entire, you know, for the entire uh, job getting done and that's guaranteed money you know and when they tried to convince him well we're going into a crypt the crypt is of you know a rich family there's probably more wealth there you know and he wasn't having it he was like I know that I'm going to get paid up front for this me and the elf we decided that this is the job that we're going to do and we're keeping that fee and then anything else above and beyond that, sure, we'll share with the rest of you. But, you know, he wanted his 25 gold plus 10 gold per head of each bat that he uh, got. And so Brother Calder was like, all right, we will help you with this farm if you promise to then accompany us to this crypt later on. And the expression was put out there or somebody had said, uh, I forget who it was. We know the dead will still be there. So let's go take care of the farm first because who knows how long the bats will be there or if they're there at all or whatever. And so the party then, after several more minutes of, you know, having lunch and, and doing whatever preparation they had to do, they were then going to set out to the farm. So I'm going to switch views here. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the D20 screen. And uh, I'm still working out how to use the D20 system. So we have uh, we have the icons down here in the bottom, and these are each of the players logged in. And then their corresponding icons for their characters are in and around. Uh, you can see them down here in this tree. They originally came in along this road and spoke to the owners of the farm and confirmed that, yes, this is the farm they're looking for, and yes, they do have a bat problem. And yes, they are going to pay them what they promised to pay them. And so as they moved further out into this field over by this yellow box over here, um, that's a silo that represents a silo that the bats were supposedly in. The bats attacked them. Now, even though it's a first, uh, a first uh, level party, the, um, the players had to resort to using primarily their, uh, their ranged weapons. And so they wounded this first bat uh, with a, a combination of uh, crossbow fire and uh, I believe one sword hit on this uh, bat here. The second bat that you see over here, that bat was actually killed by, uh, by a crossbow and a light crossbow bolt. Uh, actually, Jace, the thief, fired her light crossbow bolt, killing that bat. When that bat was killed, the screech that it had uh, emanated from it is what attracted the harpy, which lived nearby. And not quite known by the players or not whether it was the harpy that was the real nuisance of this farm or if it, it's just a coincidence that the harpy had to be nearby heard the scream and just came in so um so that's unknown to the players um you know and the harpy came in and there was of course a a, a combat that took place and the harpy was killed and it was at that point that the the elf, all right, Tyrande, kind of expressed the desire to um, to adhere to uh, her love of nature, 
And since all animals and all life are, are part of nature, uh, she wanted to give this, uh, this animal a proper burial or at least lay it down, you know, uh, in, near its nest uh, so that it could properly be, uh, you know, left behind uh, in nature. Now, of course, the, the magic user wanted to make sure that she got her, uh, that she was going to get the feathers that she needed. And as they were trying to dispose of the body, the, the elf had gone up into the tree, um, was looking for a way of, I guess, climbing and surmounting the tree. The thief had gone up instead um, with a effective climbing roll. And actually you could see over here, um, Lara's climbing roll here. She rolled a, a success. So she was able to climb up, uh, the tree and they're interwoven into the nest. She discovered treasure. And so there would be even more treasure for the dwarf. So now Noggin was really happy that he was going to get even more treasure than what was promised. And everybody else would, would be able to share out on that as well. And they went back to the farmer, showed or told the story about the, the harpy that they had killed. They showed evidence of the two bats that they had killed. Uh, the rest of the bats that, that were in the area were just ordinary bats. And so they sat down for a meal, and the next morning, presumably, they will go back towards the camp and take over the next part of the adventure. So this was a side adventure, a mini adventure, uh, basically, that um, they could have completely avoided and gone right into the, uh, into the main quest of this uh, starting adventure. So... I switch views back. So as you can see there, there's, there's a lot of flexibility, a lot of freedom going on here, a lot of role play, even though the system does rely quite a bit on dice rolling and, and such, uh, wasn't an inordinate amount of dice rolling uh, involved. There was really only about two combats uh, involved and there was a few perception checks or attribute checks here and there along the way, more for the purposes of, of discovering information and, uh, and role playing, you know, basically. So, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed the session. You know, I hope that the players had enjoyed the session. Uh, we had a lot of good laughs along the time. We ran about, uh, two hours and 45 minutes long. You know, so it was a, it was a pretty decently length section uh, session uh, that uh, and they, they accomplished quite a bit from the introduction, which took probably about the first hour, which is introducing the characters. And then uh, doing that mini adventure was was probably about an hour and a half or so, uh, give or take that 15 minutes. So <clears throat> I'm going to continue doing this format of just doing recaps instead of showing um, actual gameplay. Um, because for you to sit through three hours of a, uh, you know, of an actual gameplay, I think would be excessive, you know, on your part. And so, um, but what I will do is I will have gameplay session videos when we're focusing in on some kind of like a, a really monumental battle. Or something like that. So you will get to see uh, that take place. Uh, and that's also revolves around my becoming much more familiar with World 20 as well. Uh, so as the presentation of the actual gameplay becomes a little bit more exciting and interesting, then I will include some more of those as well. But in the meantime, thank you for joining. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please consider subscribing. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, share it around. You know, if you have other players, uh, other people that are interested in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, Beck Me or any of the older Dungeons and Dragons versions, you know, please share the video so that they can get a, a sense of, you know, how it kind of plays out and, uh, you know, and how much fun can be really had with these older systems. And, uh, 
Leave your comments if you have anything you, you'd like to say, uh, anything you, su you know, suggest I take a look at. Um, please leave a comment there. I will take a look at it. And uh, for the players, if you're watching this, uh, if you want to jump in and, and, you know, say a little something about your character, you're welcome to do so. And uh, once we get through this first, uh, this first few adventures, uh, we probably will have like a, you know, a, uh, another recap uh, where it's more of a, a video recap where all of us are, are kind of talking about the uh, the campaign as it's rolling out. So uh, once again, uh, be safe out there. Uh, look forward to seeing you on the gaming screen, you know, sometime soon. And, uh, and just keep on gaming. Uh, there's a lot of great games out there. A lot of people are playing online. And, um, you know, I just see across Facebook and other and other sites just people putting together these virtual games uh, going on. Like I said, I, I put together a group of uh, seven players in probably about 10 days. Uh, that's what it took to get the entire group together. And uh, it looks like we're going to have a, a great time uh, running this campaign for, you know, many weeks or hopefully months or longer uh, with this group. I'm really excited to do, at least try uh, for it to be as long lasting as uh, as possible. So once again, be safe. Enjoy. Thanks for stopping by.